Hello. Well, now we are really romping through the reading of this book, um, Trout Fishing in Chilean Rivers. We're on chapter 14, which is page 246. Um, and we've only got, well, the last page is page 337. So you can see that it's we're we're getting we're on the home stretch almost, I would say. Um, all right, so um, chapter 14 is Pangui Pulli. And there is a, I put a, a photograph of Pangui Pulli in the footnote there. Um, but you'll, you'll have seen the color uh, photo in my um, video, short video, which I did introducing all the illustrations, if you've watched it. Um, anyway, uh, here we go. Pangui Pulli, the gentle art of angling is a wonderful sport which brings out the best in a man. It takes him away from the crowded centers of life into beautiful country. It gives him rest and contentment and enables him to relax from his troubles and anxieties. It provides him with healthy exercise in the fresh air and improves his mental outlook and it tests his skill and ingenuity. Unfortunately, however, it brings out another trait in his character, selfishness. And the more practiced and experienced the angler becomes, the more does this uncharitable attitude towards his fellow anglers manifest itself. Have you ever known or heard of the angler who would introduce his visitor to his favorite stretch of water on the river? Or can you imagine an angler who discovers a new and untouched stream brimful of trout, spreading the news abroad for the benefit of others? While some of my readers may object to the insinuation that this disagreeable trait is common to anglers, I am sure they will admit that there are few who overcome the temptation to keep their information to themselves. The general tendency is to keep quiet, or as it is so aptly expressed in Spanish, caladito, or is that calladito? I'm not quite sure. Calladito, I think. A little silent about one's discoveries and to reap the benefit as long as secrecy can be maintained. In telling the world of the glories of Pangui Pulli, I am running the risk of incurring the displeasure of the fishermen in this country who have found it and are hoping that its development as a fishing resort will be retarded as long as possible. But that is indeed a forlorn hope. The point about Pangui Pulli at present is that it is off the beaten track and fishermen who go there must be prepared to fend for themselves and to rough it unless they have the luck to be invited to a farm or private fishing lodge in the district. From the standpoint of the fishermen from abroad, it is almost out of the question. And if it were not on account of its future possibilities, I should have omitted it from this book because of the lack of hotel accommodation there. Until a matter of 15 years ago, a very few fishermen in, very few fishermen in Chile could have told you where Pangui Pulli was. And quite the majority, the big majority, did not know that it even existed. In a fishing sense, it was discovered by the late John P. Chadwick, and until his death, he was a regular visitor there throughout the fishing season. He had three fishing cabins in that district, the main one of which stands on a lonely spot on the shores of the lake between the rivers Enco and Fui, and is one of the few habitations there. Today, relatively few of the fishermen in Chile have had the pleasure of fishing there and know of the excellent sport to be had in the rivers in that region. The older fishermen in this country tell of the early days in Pucón, 30 or 40 years ago, when the journey there was such an adventure that it made them think twice before attempting it, and when they had to camp out on the banks of the river when they got there. They were the pioneers of fishing in Chile and richly deserved the glorious sport they got, for which they had to undergo a good deal of hardship. And look at Pucón today with the railhead at Villa Rica instead of Freire, with a motor road from Villa Rica along the shores of the lake and several hotels available, including the railway hotel, with all its comfort for the fishing visitor. Something similar is bound to happen in Pangui Pulli in the not far distant future and indeed is already happening if the rumor is correct that a semi-fiscal concern connected with the Chilean government to intends to build three fishing hotels in or near the Pangui Pulli district, one of which at Lake Pirihueco is already open. 
The sites chosen for the others are Lake Kalafken and Lake Rinihue, I believe. The late John P. Chadwick was a keen student of the life and habits of fish. And when he found his old haunts being overrun with fishermen, he looked for new water. The knowledge that the river San Pedro above and below Estacion Los Lagos was full of trout of good condition and size, and that the trout must inevitably have found their way through Lake Rinihue up the river Enco to Lake Panguipulli and thence to the rivers Fui and Guanehue, Guanehue, drove him to the conclusion that he should concentrate his attention on the rivers running in and out of Lake Panguipulli. He had the foresight to see that this system of interconnected lakes and rivers provided a splendid background for the de development of trout under ideal conditions. Just how right he was will be shown a little later when I give you a few facts and figures regarding the fishing at Panguipulli. A glance at the map will show you that this system of rivers and lakes of which Lake Panguipulli is the center connects up with Lake Pirihueco and finally with Lake Laca over the Argentine border. Someday we shall hear a great deal, I fancy, about the fishing in the Pirihueco district. And at the end of this chapter, I have a short story to tell about what lies in store for the angler there. Meanwhile, there is no doubt in my mind that the Panguipulli district will be developed still further within a few years and become one of the favorite fishing resorts in the country. The trip to Panguipulli is made by road from the main line station at Lanco, 18 hours from Santiago by the express train, and covers a distance of roughly 50 kilometers, 31 miles. The hotel at Panguipulli itself is said to be fairly good, but the trouble is that it is quite a long way from the rivers Enco and Fui, and the lake tug only does the trip around the lake on two days of the week at present. For the fisherman, the hotel is too far away from the fishing to be of any use to him. The lake is long and narrow and has the reputation of being somewhat treacherous as storms are apt to come up suddenly and render navigation difficult. It will be readily seen that the lack of accommodation on the southern end of the lake is a serious difficulty for the fishermen and the reason for the fishing being available only to a select few at present. The rivers are big and there is plenty of scope for the boat fishermen and even more particularly for the bank fishermen. Indeed of the big five, this is the place where the bank fisherman can really enjoy himself most, especially in the river Fui, where he can fish all day long without a boat. This is one of the best features about Pangui Pulli, namely that it caters for every type of fisherman. In the river Enco, a boat is necessary and the bank fishing is limited. In order to avoid the risk of wearying my readers, I have purposely refrained from quoting records of individual catches, and indeed, few are available in Chile, even if I wish to quote them, as the average fisherman is not interested in keeping a fishing log. However, I am much indebted to Fred Utz, uh, UTZ that is, for a most interesting set of records of trips he made to Pangui Pulli in the company of the late John P. Chadwick, and a few facts extracted therefrom will give my readers a very good idea of the quality of fishing there. The total of two trips of six days each were as follows. Um, and then we have um, a kind of uh, schedule. There we are. And another one on the other page. Um, so we've got um, the month, uh, March 1939 and January 1940, and the total number of fish caught total weight in pounds and average weight in pounds. So in March 1939, the total number of fish caught was 78, weighing 392 pounds with an average weight of 5.03 pounds. Whereas in January 1940, 65 fish were caught, uh, weighing 349.5 pounds uh, with an average weight of 5.38 pounds. Um, so the total number of fish caught in March and January, sorry, March 1939 and January 1940 was 143. The total weight in pounds uh, for both months was 741.5 pounds and the average weight was 5.18 pounds. Uh, this means an average catch over the two trips of approximately six fish per day per fisherman 
at an average weight of over five pounds for, per fish, and on several days the weather was bad. The January 1940 trips shows the following interesting details. So um, we've got the place, uh, number of fish caught, total weight in pounds, and average weight in pounds. So this is all in January 1940. The places were um, River Fui, 18 fish were caught, weight uh, in pounds, 78.5 pounds, average weight in pounds, 4.36 pounds. The upper river Enco, uh, 10 fish were caught, weight in pounds, total weight in pounds was 24 pounds, and the average weight in pounds was 2.4 pounds. And the lower river Enco and outlet to Lake Rinuihue, um, 37 fish were caught, uh, total weight in pounds was 247 pounds, and the average weight in pounds was 6.67 pounds. So giving a, a total for the three places of 65 fish caught, uh, 349.5 pounds total weight, and an average weight of 5.38 pounds. The fishing in the River Fui includes the outlet to Lake Pangui Pulli, which presumably accounts for the increased average weight over the fish caught in the upper Enco. Um, the fish seem to run bigger in the lower Enco and at the outlet to, outlet to Lake Rinihue. In the March 1939 trip, no brown trout were caught, and in the January 1940 trip, there were only two, and they were taken in the river Enco. Previously, three brown trout were reported from the Enco in the 1938 season, including one of 18 pounds caught on a fly by the late John P. Chadwick. In the river San Pedro, there are probably more brown than rainbow, and the fact that brown trout have apparently not yet penetrated into the river Fui is interesting as further evidence, if it were required, of their slowness in migrating as compared with rainbows. In the March 1939 trip, there were seven fish of 10 pounds or more, the largest being a rainbow weighing 14 and a quarter pounds, length 32 inches, girth 18 and three quarter inches. In the January 1940 trip, there were six fish of 10 pounds or more, the largest of which was a 15 pound rainbow, length 30, 32 and three quarter inches, girth 18 and three eighth inches, caught by the late John P. Chadwick. A photograph of this beautiful fish is shown on page blank, as, as usual, there is no photograph at this time. Uh, I don't know if I will be able to find them. The cigarette packet between the jaws gives a good idea of the fish. I trust that my readers are duly impressed, uh, but in case there should be any doubt as to the fishing in this district, here is an evening catch made by Fred Utz in March 1939. Uh, fishing in the lower Enco and the outlet, outlet to Lake Rinuhue, he caught 19 rainbows in three and a half hours with a total weight of 78 and a half pounds. A photograph of this wonderful catch is shown on page blank. The biggest weighed 12 pounds and the smallest one and a half pounds, and the average weight was 4.18 pounds. Does that not whet your appetite? On another evening in the big pool above the outlet to Lake Rinuhue on the river Enco, he taught, caught two rainbows weighing 11 and a half pounds, each within one hour. They were both taken on Dr. McLean's crab fly. A point which I should like to emphasize is that on both trips, nothing but a fly was used. The streamer salmon flies were by far the most deadly. The following information regarding a trip to Pangui Pulli made by AWF Duncan, one of our ablest fishermen with wide experience is also worth recording. The trip was made in March 1940 and occupied five days. Total number of fish caught, 43. Total weight in pounds, 218.5. Average weight in pounds, 5.08. The last day's fishing represented 13 rainbow, averaging 5.09 pounds, and is described as the finest day's trout fishing I ever had. Points of interest in connection with this trip were that the weather was bad at first and the river slightly discolored. The fishing was all in the river Fui and exclusively from the bank with a fly. No brown trout were caught. A five ounce rod measuring nine feet was used. Streamer salmon flies with one slash zero hook were used each day until the final day. 
when the size was reduced to number one hook as the weather was good and the water clear. The most successful fly on this final day was made up of turkey wings, long, blue hackle, gold and blue body. Lest my readers should think that the records quoted are exceptional, I should mention that the experience of other fishermen provides ample cor corroboration that the average size of rainbow taken in this district up to 1940 was over five pounds in weight. I think you will agree that my enthusiasm over Pangui Pulli is justified. And if there is better trout fishing to be had anywhere in the world, I should like to hear of it. Its main attraction lies in the fact that it is still undeveloped. And I sincerely trust that the hand of man will not be instrumental in damaging it in an attempt to exploit its lucrative value and extend the enjoyment of its pleasure to fishermen generally as against the privileged few who can enjoy it at present. Crown Kenrick, who is also mentioned, by the way, in uh, Haig Brown's Fisherman's Winter. Crown Kenrick has a farm on the banks of the River Enko, and the fortunate fishermen who have had the privilege of spending a holiday there are enthusiastic about the comfort of the house and the glorious fishing. He is to be congratulated on his choice of a farm right in the heart of this fisherman's Eden. My slogan is keep your eye on Pangui Pulli, and that goes for the authorities as well as the fishermen. And now in the fashion of the broadcast announcer, let me take you over to the Argentine for a brief spell and give you an idea of how all this splendid fishing in Chile is linked up with the magnificent sport to be had on the other side of the border. I hope I shall not be accused of poaching. Several years ago, Agustin R. Edwards and his son left Pucon by motorcar for San Martin in the Argentine, a trip which occupied 14 hours, although the distance is only some 200 kilometers, 125 miles, including a trip by motor ferry across Lake Quilehue, or Quilehue, Quilehue, I think. Q-U-I-L-L-E-H-U-E, on the Chilean side of the frontier. He speaks very highly of the Hotel Los Andes at San Martin, and also of the rainbow trout fishing in the rivers Chimehuin and Quilquihue, in that district. But the outstanding feature of the trip was the experience of fishing for landlocked salmon, Salmo Sebago, in the river Traful, several hours away from San Martin. This is a most beautiful river near which is the home of Mr. La Riviere, a very keen Argentine angler who bought the estate called La Primavera some years ago. I understand that Argentine fishing legislation provides for private fishing rights, and Mr. La Riviere takes great care of the river, which contains rainbow and brown, brown trout in addition to the salmon. The fishing is described as difficult as the water is crystal clear and the salmon are exceedingly wary, so that you literally have to stalk them. Agustin, Ed, Agustin Edwards gave me a vivid account of the catching of the one salmon he took on one of his own streamer flies, a beautiful fish in fine condition weighing just over 11 pounds. After fishing for brook trout in a small stream called the Arroyo Culebra, which enters Lake Melikina, the return trip to Chile was made via Lake Laca and Lake Pirihueco. The trip across Lake Laca takes three hours by motor launch, and at Huahun, the Argentine frontier post on the western end of the lake, there is an excellent small hotel owned by a Dutchman married to a Chilean. The trip from Huahun to Pirihueco at the eastern end of the lake of the same name can only be made on horseback or by foot at present. At Pirihueco, one of the three hotels mentioned earlier in this chapter is now available to fishermen, and it is reported also that the river Huahun, close to the hotel, has been stocked with landlocked salmon and rainbow trout. Uh, landlocked salmon, that would be Salmo Sebago, wouldn't it? Yes. Lake Pirihueco connects up with the river Fui and consequently with the whole Pangui Pulli district, but up to date there have been no trout in the Lake Pirihueco district owing to the inability of the trout to get up over the big falls at Huilo Huilo on the river Fui. With ordinary luck, now that the lake has been stocked, the Pirihueco district should develop into an attractive fishing resort. It is just as well that fresh places are being opened up as every year there are more people fishing. 
At present, it is no easy matter to travel from Pirihueco to Panguipulli and vice versa, but in a few years' time, the transport problem will assuredly be solved and fishermen will enjoy the magnificent sport which can be foreseen in the Pirihueco district. As mentioned in an earlier chapter, this new hotel at Pirihueco is connected with the Hotel Crilon in Santiago and already in its short history has established a first-class reputation. An important point to mention also is that there is a landing field at Pirihueco and the possibility of traveling there by air from Santiago and other places in contrast to the tiring trip by land changes the complexion of things. The whole Panguipulli district has a great deal in store for fishermen in the future. And that is the end of chapter 14. So we continue with chapter 15, uh, page 265, uh, Estación Los Lagos. The river San Pedro, uh, which I have, there we are, Rio San Pedro, flows out of Lake Rinuihue, referred to in the previous chapter, and at Antihue, Antilhue, sorry, joins the river Calle Calle, which enters the sea at the port of Valdivia. It is really in interconnected with the Pangui Pulli district, but is generally regarded as a separate fishing resort. Trout, rainbow, steelhead and brown are to be found in every part of the river from its source to the mouth. And from the angler's point of view, the most central place to stay in is Estacion Los Lagos, the lake's station, which as its name implies is on the main railway line and from which one can easily can obtain easy access to long stretches of water above and below. The fishing hotel in Estacion Los Lagos is owned by Don Emilio Zadzavka, Zadzavka, uh, Z-A-D-Z-A-W-K, who provides transport facilities for boats and fishermen and generally looks after their requirements. It is always booked up well ahead of time for each fishing season. The San Pedro is a big river in every sense of the word, and I should say that its main characteristic is that so many big fish are taken out of it. This is particularly the case in the latter part of the season, when there is not so much water, and I should go so far as to say that you are unlucky if you fish the river San Pedro in March or April without getting a trout over 10 pounds in weight. The fish in this river are in the majority brown trout and towards the end of the season, they show splendid fighting qualities. From the fisherman's point of view, there is comparatively little bank fishing above Estacion Los Lagos, but below he is more fortunate and all the way down to Antilhue, he will find plenty of scope. The boat fisherman is in his element on this river, and except on a very bad day, he can rely on getting 10 to 20 fish without any trouble, including generally one or two over five pounds. The surrounding country is lovely, especially in the upper reaches of the river. If you decide to fish above Estacion Los Lagos, you go up by car in the morning and return to the hotel by boat. And if you elect to go down, down the river, you can return by train in the evening. Boats are transported upriver by truck, and the fishing arrangements generally are handled efficiently. Some distance above the hotel, possibly about five miles, there is a tributary of the river San Pedro called the Quinchilca, which flows into the main river from a southeasterly direction. Some years ago, a small fishing hotel owned by a Swiss of the name of Alberto Schwarm opened up in, on this river, and the reports about it are very favorable. I have heard of a catch of 40 pounds of trout there in one day, including a fish of nearly 14 pounds and two others weighing 10 and eight pounds respectively, all brown trout. As a general rule, the trout do not run so large as in the main river, but on the other hand, you can wade to your heart's content, although it is somewhat heavy going in places. In the early part of the season and later on, if there is sufficient water, it is possible to go down by boat and it must make an excellent day's fishing under such conditions as, Without the assistance of a boat to enable one to get from point to point, it is exceedingly hard work. I have reason to remember this as late in the season when I fished the Kinchilka, it was out of the question to use a boat and at the end of the day, I was dead tired. I had arranged to meet my boat at four o'clock in the afternoon at the bridge near the junction with the main river. When I arrived there, I had no other thought but a hot bath as soon as I could reach the hotel. The sole of one of my fishing boots was hanging off and I had fallen into the river during the course of the day. 
On the other side of the scales, however, I had a dozen excellent fish to my credit and highly satisfied was quite ready to call it a day. My boatman, however, had other ideas and persuaded me that as I was going to Santiago the next day, and this was my last day on the river, it was out of the question to row down to the hotel without even trolling a fly. He reminded me that a day or two previously, we had seen evidence of a big fish at the outlet of the Kinchilka to the main river where the waters meet. And to add weight to his argument, he declared that big fish were constantly being taken at that very place. I tried to be firm, but ultimately weakened. Fortunately, the boatman had brought up my light salmon rod, a useful weapon for tackling a big fish, and he had it ready except for the cast. I selected a strong cast, which I had made up from odd bits of gut the previous evening, and a very large silver doctor salmon fly, Hardy's number five slash zero hook. Off we went, my boatman fresh and keen, and I tired and rather bored with the whole proceedings having already had all the fun I wanted in one day. We reached the river San Pedro and the boatman took the boat slowly across to the far side and back again. As the fly darted into the eddy at the meeting of the waters, I felt an indecisive tug and with the feeling that it was one of those annoying small ones which would have to be put back, I struck and prepared to reel in rather hurriedly. The next thing I remember is seeing something streaking swiftly across the surface of the water in the opposite direction and my reel screaming endlessly. Then at the end of the run, the fish leapt out of the water and I realized that I was into my first big fish. The boatman shouted with a note of triumph, es una balena patron, it's a whale master, and rowed hard for the bank. Those 20 minutes were among the most exciting I have ever experienced. The fish was very active, took the line out time after time and leapt out of the water at least six times. My thoughts were centered in the certain knowledge that if I did not succeed in landing the fish, my friends would never believe how big it was and it would be just another stupid story of the big one that got away. That patched up cast kept recurring to my mind every time the fish tugged and I had further misgivings when we got him close in eventually and then found that the net was much too small for him. However, the long and the short of it was that finally, my boatman got his fingers in behind the gills of the fish and lifted him out of the water to my intense satisfaction. He was a brown trout, weighed 14 and a half pounds and measured 13 and a third inches long and stood as the record for the river up to that season. A month previously, two fish of 14 pounds were caught in the same river, one in the very same spot. And in every season, one hears constantly of fish over 10 pounds being caught there. In March, 1937, however, H.D. Humpstone broke all records for the river and at that time for Chile by catching a 20 pound trout, a fine specimen, which created quite a stir among fishermen. To return for a moment to my own story, my boatman was delighted over the success of his boat and made no protest when I began to take down my rod as soon as the fish was unhooked and told him to row to the hotel without further delay. When we got there, I recall that there was considerable excitement while the hotel keeper produced the scales and the measuring tape. The hotel was full of visitors, mostly politicians, as there was a by-election in the village on that day, and great interest was taken in the fish. The only other incident worth recording was a discussion I heard in the hotel as to how the fish was caught, which ended in the unanimous conclusion that the net was the thing. The mental reactions of a fisherman when he has his first big fish on his line are interesting to record, and I trust that I shall be forgiven for having given mine at some length. I was fortunate in having plenty of action in what seemed a very short space of time. More often than not, the big brown trout goes down to the bottom and sulks, and with a light rod, there is apparently nothing to be done about it. I have seen a fisherman sitting on a rock, waiting for an hour until the trout finally came up to the surface dead. There was no satisfaction whatsoever in the catching of the fish, and he was completely bored with the whole affair. That is the argument against fishing with a light rod in a river where you are liable to run into occasional big fish, but on the other hand, you get so much more fun out of the average fish you catch with the light rod than that as a matter of choice, I should always be in favor of fishing rather lighter than the circumstances apparently demanded. As I remarked in the chapter on tackle, my ideal weight of rod for the South is seven and a half ounces. Another interesting point which arises out of this story is the theory of the bigger the fish, the bigger the fly, which I have frequently heard discussed among fishermen in Chile without any conclusion being reached. 
On the occasion recalled, I put on the biggest fly in my collection quite deliberately and met with the immediate and most unexpected success so that it would be readily understandable if I were to uphold the theory. I think, however, that it is a mistake to use a fly designed to catch the big fish in the river, as by doing so, it is possible that you, you may frighten away a number of average sized fish on which you really depend for your sport. A great deal depends on the condition of the water. If it is crystal clear, a big fly is probably wrong. On the other hand, in deep water, a small fly may be a complete failure. Generally speaking, my opinion is that fishermen in Chile use bigger flies than are necessary or advisable. There is no credit, great credit in catching a big fish, but it is only human to try to break records once in a while. And there is certainly no rule about it, as one of the 14 pounders caught in the San Pedro in that season was taken on the dropper. Uh, dropper is an angling term, which is it's a short length of monofilament by which a fly is attached to the main trace or leader above the tail fly. Uh, so um, one of the 14 pounders caught in the San Pedro in that season was taken on the dropper, that's underlined, on a number three salmon fly, exclamation mark. I take off my hat to the fisherman who will use a dropper in a river with such fish lurking around. I should describe it as asking for trouble. Agustin R. Edwards, um, surely a different person to the one who wrote the forward, um, since the latter states at the outset that he is not a fisherman. So Agustin R. Edwards is enthusiastic about this river and speaks of the excellent sport he and his family had there. His boy and girl, aged 10 and nine years respectively, caught eight and three quarters and nine and three quarter pounders on their light rods, an experience which must have been akin to big game fishing in thrill for them. While you are at Estacion Los Lagos, it might be worth taking the train up to Lake Riñihue and crossing on the lake tug to the river Enco on the far side, the fringe of the Pangui Pulli district. Riñihue is spelled uh, R-I-N tilde I-H-U-E. So I think it's Riñihue, Riñihue, rather difficult to pronounce. But you will have to be prepared to camp out as there is no hotel accommodation up in that region. So do not even consider it unless the weather is on its best behavior. When I review what I've written about Estacion Los Lagos, I find that I've said very little actually about the river. There really is little to say about it beyond the general description that it is a big majestic river. And I, I think the photographs on page blank will give you a much better idea of it than I ever could with my pen. The fishing there during recent seasons has been excellent. And a number of fish between 10 and 15 pounds have been taken, including a 14 pounder by Colonel Lefebvre. One of my fishing friends tells me that he had an 18 pounder, a question mark, on, on for 20 minutes in the San Pedro the other day. And within a few yards of the boat, he got away. They so often do those very big ones. If you should decide to go to Estacion Los Lagos, be prepared to catch a monster as there are plenty of them in the river. And unless he is over 12 pounds, he is hardly worth, worth making a fuss about. And that is the end of chapter 15. So I shall stop here for now. Thank you again for watching. And I hope you are enjoying this as uh, enjoying hearing this as much as I am enjoying reading it. Thank you.